For millions of Americans, public transit is indispensable, providing access to a wider world. Transit serves the environment, too, by reducing traffic, energy consumption, and pollution. And by helping people get to work, to shops, to services, it contributes to the economic vitality of America's communities. But in too many communities, maintaining public transit has become more and more difficult. And transit news has too often been bad news. Once public transportation was routinely used by urban dwellers and revenues from fares covered all costs. But after World War II, profound changes shifted population to new suburbs, cutting transit's urban ridership. And by the 1970s, fares no longer covered costs. As a result, transit raised fares and curtailed service. This was bad news for the millions of Americans who still depended on transit, and it triggered an historic public policy response. In locality after locality, officials created public transit agencies to maintain and improve vital services. And they kept fares affordable by supplementing them with subsidies from taxes. Adding tax subsidies changed transit arithmetic significantly. It preserved transit, but at a cost that was to prove staggering. For buried in this funding formula was a fiscal time bomb waiting to explode. During the 1970s, transit's costs soared, twice as fast as inflation. Soon, fares covered only 40% of costs. That meant tax subsidies had to rise. They did, a staggering 1,600%. Transit costs were skidding out of control. At the same time, new service needs were emerging for elderly and handicapped persons and for persons traveling within suburbs but conventional transit could not respond. Here are news highlights at noon. The Municipal Transit Authority Board will vote today on major service cuts. More than 15 bus lines will be abandoned or curtailed in an effort to save the city $3.7 million. Once again, transit news was bad news, and the bad news was made worse by a larger crisis. Around the country, demand for government services was increasing at the same time that the tax base that supported these services was being eroded. Swollen transit budgets were competing with other services for scarce tax dollars, and local officials were facing painful choices. Raise taxes, raise fares, cut service, defer or cancel badly needed capital improvements. Once again, transit had become the victim of change. If service was to be preserved, transit would have to change too. And once again, a crisis triggered an historic response. It began with some beleaguered local officials asking a simple question. How can we provide service most efficiently and economically for the people who are depending on us? The answer they came up with wasn't very original. Certain other public services used it too, but applying it to public transit was new. How could service be best provided by going out to the marketplace and buying it through competitive contracting from private firms at a cost below that of direct public service. This strategy takes advantage of competition's inherent cost control incentives. Where public transit authorities have operated without competitive incentives, costs have skyrocketed. Even where tax subsidies have not risen, costs have inevitably forcing fare increases and service reductions. The losers have been the riders and the taxpayers. Recent studies are producing overwhelming evidence that opening up public transit service to competitive contracting can cut costs tremendously. Savings reported by agencies already using this arrangement typically range from about 20% to almost 60%. And such savings are in line with those obtained from competitive contracting of other public services like trash collection, where contracting has been practiced for many years. An important effect noticed in those cases is that when a public agency continues to provide some of the service, then the competition from the private sector spurs that agency on to cut waste and reduce costs too. So there's a double return from competitive contracting. 
it's important to recognize that competitive contracting is not normally undertaken for partisan political or ideological reasons. It's found in large metropolitan areas and small ones, in rural areas, in areas of all political orientations. Not only are cost savings substantial, savings on contracted routes can help support service on directly operated routes too. Here's how contracting works. The most important feature of contracting is something that doesn't change at all. Public agencies retain full control. They decide which services to contract out and which to operate directly themselves. Because competition keeps contracted costs substantially below direct operating costs, agencies generally contract out their costliest routes, suburban, peak period express, and dial-a-ride. That's because routes they're losing the most money on promise the greatest savings. Public agencies contract for a fee that is competitively determined. They specify the length of the contract, conditions under which it may be revised, fares, routes, schedules, transfers, and standards of service. So that vehicles operated under contract will look the same as directly operated vehicles, agencies may also specify how vehicles should be painted. Private vendors can provide capital equipment, or public agencies can obtain federal funds for capital costs and then lease equipment to vendors. Contracting creates new employment opportunities with private firms, and transit agencies can phase in contracting within their own employee attrition rates. Typical bidders include charter and intercity bus companies, taxi operators, airport bus and van operators, and nationally known transportation companies. Their savings are achieved principally through labor and administrative efficiencies. After a contract is awarded, public agencies monitor performance. When the contract expires, agencies are free to renew it, amend it, or drop it. This gives them the flexibility to adjust service to changing needs. Contracting carries no risks because agencies contract only on their own terms. Otherwise, they continue direct service. Because there's no risk, more and more localities are using contracting to expand their management options, and not just in transit. As we've noted, contracting is not exactly a new idea. It's been used all around the country for years for other services. In Los Angeles County, we've saved more than $67 million by contracting out everything from park maintenance to data processing. The next logical step is using the private sector to provide public transportation. Another example of contracting is in public education. Privately contracted bus service for public schools carries three times more passengers than public transit. That contracted service has proved less expensive than direct service and has spurred cost savings in direct service too. What makes the case for contracting most eloquently is the testimony from local officials who are using it. Let's listen to what some of them have to say. I'm Stark Taylor, mayor of Dallas, Texas. By the year 2010, Dallas will be the fifth largest urban center in the United States. We're also building the nation's second largest mass transit system, DART. When we began, we wanted to get results early. You have to do a good job to talk Texans out of their cars. We contracted with a private sector firm to manage, operate, and maintain our 11 suburban express routes. The impact? Significant cost savings and high quality service. In just one year, ridership on these routes jumped from 16,000 to 42,000 commuters per week. Now that's results. The transit industry is constantly changing and today's transit manager must be in a position to adapt rapidly to new ideas. No longer can he afford to provide the same kind of high cost service that the industry has traditionally offered. Here in Allegheny County, we've learned that by using private carriers to provide paratransit service for elderly and handicapped persons, this much needed service can be provided in a cost effective and efficient manner. It's our belief that the future use of private carriers will result in improved service to the public at lower cost. I feel it's my responsibility as a transit board member to examine all available options while we strive to provide the highest quality service at the lowest cost. Funding cutbacks at the federal and state level demand that we become more innovative in our planning and funding of service. Competitive bidding for service is one tool to be used by management to maximize dollar effectiveness. 
I am convinced that introducing the private sector and competition into mass transit is among the healthiest steps we can take today. Introducing a market-oriented approach helps us to provide the kind of service tailored to the different community needs. One system providing one kind of service simply won't do anymore. We need a market-oriented approach that is tailored to different needs. We've created the Office of Private Sector Initiatives here at the Urban Mass Transit Administration to help any community and any private sector operator get started. Use of competitive contracting is growing for one reason. It works for everybody because transit agencies retain full control, gain flexibility, and expand their management options. Competition reduces the cost of service up to 60% and moderates cost increases. For transit riders, this can mean lower fares, while service levels are maintained or improved. And for taxpayers, it means more mileage from tax dollars. With competitive contracting, transit becomes affordable for all, for both the riders and the taxpayers. That makes transit news good news. And the good news is that through contracting, public agencies can harness the power of competition to Keep vital transit services rolling, meet changing needs, serve environmental goals, and contribute to the economic and social vitality of our nation's communities. But the power to instill competition in the provision of transit and other public services ultimately rests with responsible local public officials. For more information about how competitive contracting can serve your community, contact the American Bus Association the International Taxi Cab Association, or the Department of Transportation's Office of Private Sector Initiatives. We'll be glad to help.